everyone. Welcome. Thanks for starting your Monday with us. I see lots of familiar faces out there. We're really glad to have you here today. Uh, I'm kind of your Joe Friday for today. Uh, if you remember, those under uh, over 35 will know, but those friends under 35 may not. Joe Friday was the Los Angeles cop who frequently interrupted uh, testimony by a person who was interviewing. In fact, just the facts, man. Um, and that's really what Sandy and Joanne asked us to do. Um, uh, our team, uh, Jessica Myers, would you stand up, Jessica? And Krista Otteson. Krista, are you here? Can you stand up, please? Uh, these are the two um, uh, people behind uh, much of this presentation. They dug out a lot of these facts, over 200 different documents. This is primarily what we call in the research world the secondary analysis. That is, we were looking for all of the extent literature that actually described what was going on in the world of immigration. We looked at national literature, we looked at uh, regional literature, and we looked at local literature. Uh, some of the information we have to extrapolate because it's not all about Minnesota. Um, but immigration is a global issue, uh, and uh, it's, it's an issue that's talked about in virtually every part of the world. And so today we're going to take a focus on the facts and try to understand as best we can what we now know, and then also discuss uh, those things that we don't know and how we might know them better and how we can bring ourselves into this discussion in an effective, knowledgeable, thoughtful way. So the clicker, I can advance from here. Okay. So here's the study. I talked to you just briefly about this. Uh, it provides the facts on immigration, what's known and unknown. Focuses on education, economy, and labor force. And you'll later hear from Bill Blazer today. Uh, Bill was involved in helping us to identify some information uh, that was part of the local scene from the business community and understanding more about the workforce issues and the variety of sources of data we could go to on workforce. Um, we've also looked at literature on national, local, and regional level, as I mentioned, and provide a view of various stakeholders. The uh, report itself, which is about 90 pages long, uh, I heard from Joanne this morning when I came in that it will be posted on, our, uh, on the Minneapolis Foundation website with at least a link to the Wilder Research website by noon today. So that's the full report. Um, and in there, in that document, you'll find a rich description uh, from a variety of folks who uh, we refer to as key informants, but they're basically people that have a wide range of viewpoints on immigration in our state. And we've used that voice of various people to inform this discussion. Uh, I will not be using a lot of quoted material today in my Joe Friday role, but um, I will ask you to go ahead online, find the report uh, with the same name on the website of the Minneapolis Foundation or Wilder. Um, and there you'll have a lot more detail about the open-ended comments provided by our stakeholders. So here's the <clears throat> first basic fact, and Paul's already previewed this. We have roughly 340,000 immigrants in Minnesota. Uh, over the course of the last 15 to 20 years, however, we've had nearly a million immigrants pass through our state. For not all immigrants, is this a final destination? Um, that number was from 08, uh, and it's represented from the American Community Survey data, which is estimate data using a 20% sample. Um, we fortunately are in a position very soon to have the 2010 census data in hand, um, and I suspect that number will grow significantly. Percentage of this foreign born, again, as intimated, is a little different for Minnesota than it is for other states. You see in this graphic here by the green, uh, the green line is Minnesota, and you'll see that we're um, uh, above six and six and a half percent overall as a state, as Paul pointed out, 10 to 11 to 12 percent almost in the metro area. But nationwide, we see higher percentages of immigrants. Uh, and so the nationwide figure is above 12, 12 and a half to 13 percent. One of the things, however, that is different <clears throat> uh, is that Minnesota has been a receiving region uh, for refugees and asylees. And we have welcomed foreign-born populations during the last two decades in significant number, in greater proportion than has been so in other parts of the United States. You see that we had a 130% uh, increase in our foreign-born population from 90 to 2000, where the rest of the United States only had a 57% increase. Similarly, during the, the, the most recent decade, and we don't have the figures to the end of the decade yet, uh, uh, but we see that we had a 33% compared to 22% growth uh, nationwide. So again, we are outpacing our percentage growth in the population 
of uh, foreign-born populations coming to Minnesota. Uh, we also have a significant uh, undocumented uh, population, people whose entry into this country uh, constituted a violation of uh, immigration law. And the estimates of this population vary widely. Jessica and Krista did their very best to try to land on the very best numbers we could find. But still, we have a fairly wide range, from 55,000 to 85,000. Um, and after the 2010 census, we'll see how well these numbers stand up. Uh, we also have some issues in the enrollment and, and interviewing individuals who are undocumented as part of the census because of their fear of being detected and, and deported. But we can safely say, and the legislative auditor has said the same, that there is no definitive data regarding the number of demographic characteristics of those who have entered the state illegally. The refugee population in Minnesota is also significant. Uh, we have a higher proportion of refugees, again, compared to other states in the United States when looking at their foreign-born population. Uh, roughly 23% of Minnesota's uh, immigrants are refugees, and 45% of the legal status that was granted through green cards went to refugees and asylees in our state, I think, in, the, in 2008, which is where we had the most recent numbers. Our largest groups are from Laos, Vietnam, and Somalia, and as all of you know, they are often the victims of torture, experience loss and emotional tra trauma. Um, I, I'm sure uh, uh, we could hear some very thoughtful and um, helpful stories in, in, st in strengthening our understanding for many of the people that are in this room today, uh, including our new president of the Wilder Foundation. But uh, Minnesota has been at the forefront in leading the opportunities for the adjustment uh, uh, and uh, opportunities in the workforce for refugees and asylees, uh, including Rudy, Rudy Perpich's work in establishing the Center for Victims of Torture and the continuing work that that's, that organization does both in this country, in this state, in this country, and around the world. Um, we also uh, have some access to more services uh, for refugees and asylees. There are special dollars that follow from the feds that come into our state, uh, refugee and asylee uh, dollars that uh, help and support the early adjustment uh, of individuals to our state. We also have significant language and cultural barriers, uh, and we'll talk more about that as we talk about our issues in the public school and the education of immigrants. Minnesota's foreign-born population sending regions is also the other thing that makes us very different from other parts of the United States. We see, particularly for African immigrants, we see uh, a much higher percentage in Minnesota of African immigrants than we do in other parts of the United States. Higher percentages of Asian, uh, and slightly higher percentages of European immigrants, but significantly smaller percentages of immigrants from Latin America, including Mexico. Immigrants, <clears throat> overall, as it relates to uh, the use of services in our state, uh, uh, represent about 7% of enrollments in our state's public health programs, uh, which is similar to uh, uh, the 7% of Minnesota's population that are enrolled in public health programs in general. We have also state-funded health programs with non-citizen enrollments higher than 10%, but those programs are primarily designated specifically for refugee assistance, including emergency medical assistance and the Refugee Medical Assistance Program. We have some impact in our population on uh, the use of state dollars and state tax dollars for public assistance. But if you look across these categories, most of these dollars are in public health care. They are not in cash and food assistance. Uh, refugees and asylees, you'll see, uh, in public health care, uh, consumed $110 million in fiscal year 2005, the latest year for which we have the figures, um, uh, and cash and food assistance, uh, $45 million. Uh, lawful permanent residents, uh, at the same time, consumed $134 million of these, re of these resources, compared to $30 million in cash and food assistance. Uh, and you'll see many smaller amounts of money for undocumented persons and other non-citizens. Um, on, on the asset side, and this is a fact that's very infrequently discussed in the public media, is that undocumented workers contribute $8.5 billion to Social Security and Medicare annually. Um, and that's a source that's fairly reliable on how much money they have in there. Uh, perhaps one would argue that, but the Social Security Administration. At the federal level, undocumented workers pay more in taxes than they receive in public benefits. 
partly because once those benefits are taken from a paycheck um, uh, and deducted and sent to the federal government, uh, uh, undocumented workers don't have really access to those dollars uh, through services. Latino workers in Minnesota, to bring this a little closer to our own state, uh, in southwest Minnesota alone generate $45 million in state and local taxes. Um, our uh, economist friend at Concordia, Bruce Corey, has helped to look at specific immigrant populations throughout um, Minnesota uh, and helped us to do some of this documentation. The St. Paul Neighborhood Development Center reports that as of 2012, 138 immigrant-owned businesses had created 386 new jobs. So that's just in this community along on the east side of the river. Spent 5.6 million on payroll, rent, supplies, and other expenses. Um, and as we know, and as we've heard from our previous speakers, uh, we have a higher rate of new business starts among immigrant groups. 3% of Minnesota businesses are owned by immigrants. That seems like a relatively small percent, but annual sales are greater than $2 billion. And in 2002, uh, and that's our last year for figures, any figure, any year that you see published here is the sort of the last year for which we can get reliable figures. In 2002, we had 7,700 Asian businesses and 4,000 Hispanic businesses in our state. The labor force issue is significant. Labor force is comprised of native-born workers, uh, and that group is shrinking. Uh, and the demand for services and resources is at the same time expanding. And consequently, employers are looking for workers at both ends of the skill spectrum uh, in order to make up for the loss of workers in the current population, and especially as this very large chunk of baby boomers like myself begin to retire. Foreign-born population uh, uh, graph shows something that's really quite interesting as it relates to replacement workers for our workforce. And that is that the foreign-born population, if you look at that uh, group between the, the little, um, here. If you look at this portion of the graph here, between 18 and 45 to 50, the foreign-born population has a higher proportion uh, in those working age ranges. Um, whereas the native-born population in that age range is relatively flat. Um, that is what makes the business community come and say, if we don't attend to our opportunities to engage uh, immigrant workers, we're not going to be able to have the workforce we need in 2020 and 2030 and beyond. Um, and I'm sure Bill Blazer will reinforce that point when he has a chance to talk about it. Um, there are some effects um, uh, on wages of native-born workers. Uh, pretty much all of the things that we were able to look at show that there is a likely negative impact for those workers that are in direct competition for jobs, especially in smaller communities. So again, without the vitriol and attack language that goes on in this discussion, um, we do need to be able to talk about the facts uh, as accurately as we can and to acknowledge the facts that exist rather than to deny facts in the discussion. Um, without being able to move on to a more solid base in our, in, our, in our focus of the discussion. However, employers report great difficulty in finding native-born applicants for many jobs in agriculture, meat packing, poultry processing, and manufacturing. One of our stakeholder interviews uh, uh, was uh, a representative of the dairy industry, uh, and he told us that he thinks that many people in Minnesota would be surprised to know that one out of two dairy cows in Minnesota uh, was milked by a Latino worker. Um, if one thinks that uh, dairy in Minnesota is an all Minnesota native business, uh, think again. Um, however, overall, there is still little research to fully assess this issue on uh, wage impacts uh, and job impacts on native workers. <coughs> I talked about jobs at both sets of the skill spectrum, um, and we certainly uh, are recruiting uh, jobs at the higher ends of the skill, skill spectrum. But just to give you a sense of those jobs uh, at the uh, less skilled end of the spectrum, take a look at this uh, uh, figure. Uh, you'll see uh, in the job categories, if you can't see them in the back of the room, I'll just read through them quickly, 60% job growth in personal and home care aids almost 50% job growth in home health aids, 20% in landscaping, 17% in food prep, 15%, 14% in janitors and cleaners, another 13% maids and house cleaners. 
Um, there are a lot of individuals that are working these positions now. Uh, one of my good friends, who's uh, 95 years old, he's in a nursing home, an assisted living program, and a Masonic home. His wife is in the dementia care unit. She's cared for by Pakistanis. She's cared for by Somalis. She's cared for by Hmong people. Um, uh, Albert is a son of a Swedish immigrant whose dad told him at 10 years old that he had to stop talking Swedish and speak English in his, homes, in his, in his own household. Um, it, what's playing out in our state today is really an amazing rainbow of new wave of immigration. And this rainbow uh, is nothing like the uh, wave of immigrants we've had in the past. Paul alluded to this in his comments, but I think one of the things that we have yet we are going to gain from this is a greater perspective of Minnesotans as well as citizens, and we'll talk more about that. Let's talk about education briefly. Some school districts are stretched to the limit uh, with students with limited English proficiency, and this is particularly true in rural districts. Um, we're going to hear from Valeria Silva, our new superintendent of schools in St. Paul later today. But in 2009, non-native English speakers made up more than 40% of St. Paul schools. Um, nine districts have more than 30% of their student body with uh, limited English. And that includes three metro area uh, districts, five southern Minnesota districts, and one western district. If you look at that corridor map, you'll see that as we have 94 and 35W corridors going through Minnesota, we also have immigration moves, uh, uh, immigrants that are moving through those corridors as well, and settling in places like St. Cloud and Duluth. Uh, and especially in southern Minnesota, settling out from agricultural work. Um, education requires uh, a significant amount of resources. Schools receive about $800 per student. But only $100 of that is federal. $700 of those dollars are state dollars. Um, and that goes into helping in the education of uh, students with limited, limited English. In addition, because of the wide range of uh, differences that are represented in our immigrants today, we have such a diversity of languages that it makes it difficult to find teachers that are facile in the classroom and working with kids from both diverse language groups and diverse cultural groups. Um, and here's one of really the startling facts and one of the most important facts and one that leads directly to a recommendation. And that is that uh, the uh, students that are learning English, uh, their student to teacher ratio in Minnesota is 49 to 1. That is, we have only one teacher for every 49 English language learning students. Nationwide, that figure is closer to 19 to 1. So, what does this mean? This means that we have fewer resources concentrated on the difficulty of strengthening our opportunities for early age English language learners to gain the skills that they need to be part of the workforce of the future. And if you look at a graphic that I'm going to show you in just a minute, you'll see that one of the important factors here is that the vast majority of these students, especially in the undergrades, are themselves U.S. citizens. We've talked about how immigrants are concentrated at the top and the bottom of the education spectrum. We do have, uh, uh, for foreign-born immigrants, a significantly higher proportion that lack a high school diploma or a GED for those that are 25 and older, compared to native-born population. But in the four-year degree completion, uh, in the four-year college degrees, we have a roughly equivalent proportion of native-born and foreign-born who have achieved a bachelor's degree. The educational needs uh, of immigrants does challenge Minnesota communities. I've discussed this briefly before. But immigrants graduate at rates that are similar to native born <coughs> students, but only if they have strong English language skills. And so on-time graduation uh, for students with limited English proficiency, that is attested as limited English proficiency, is only 43% compared to those uh, who are uh, of all Minnesota students where the graduation rate is 73%. In Minnesota, children of immigrants are typically not immigrants themselves. I mentioned this briefly, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. This graphic uh, is fairly simple here. The, the little red spot on the bottom is the number of foreign-born in the 0 to 4 age range. All of these kids, these 56, probably 60,000 kids, um, the vast majority of those kids are uh, born to an immigrant parent. 
uh, but who are in fact uh, not, uh, who are in fact citizens themselves. And you see as you go up the age spectrum, slightly higher proportions at each age grouping are kids who are uh, foreign born children who come to the United States. We have some important issues in rural Minnesota, uh, and those include uh, declining rural populations. Uh, uh, we work with a number of the initiative foundations, uh, Spawn Foundations of the McKnight Foundation, and uh, they are trying to develop local philanthropy uh, in various <coughs> regions, virtually all of the regions around the state of Minnesota. And one of the things that I found very interesting in working with the initiative foundations is the significant way in which they are beginning to identify and come to grips with the immigrant issues in the small communities. Uh, part of them are the fact that rural communities are often unprepared to meet the needs of newcomers. In metro area of Minnesota, we have lots of different services. We have specialized services for different cultural groups. But in greater Minnesota, these, these uh, challenges are more significant because the same range of services does not exist. And secondly, rural communities are often the second stop for refugees. Um, and research, resources, particularly federal resources that come into our state to support refugees, are staying in the county of first settlement. And so oftentimes, when an immigrant makes a move outside of the metro area um, to start a family, to have a family, to get their kids in school, to work, to go to a work opportunity in southern Minnesota and poultry processing or dairy farming or whatever it might be, um, the resources for immigrant populations uh, that are specifically assigned for refugees and asylees in particular stay in the county for settlement. <coughs> Schools have costs and benefits. Um, more money comes into the school district with a high number of English language learners, but those English language learners present significant challenges for the school districts that are unprepared. Um, in addition, the retention among newcomers, as we've already talked about, at post-secondary levels is low, in both the secondary and post-secondary levels. And really the only solution to that lower retention rate for graduation is strengthening the resources that go into English language learners at the early grades. So we have a political environment in which all of these facts are, uh, are, are, are landing. Um, one is that uh, we have various proposals in state legislature and over the past two years, we've seen proposals in each of the following areas. Attempts at increased enforcement and apprehension of illegal immigrants. We know with new recent laws passed in, in states like Arizona uh, that have caused significant brouhaha across the country. Restriction of immigrants from government-provided services um, and uh, famous outburst during Obama's speech to Congress. Um, and it was all about the question of whether immigrants uh, and particularly uh, undocumented immigrants could access uh, services provided by federal resources. Increasing access to higher education among undocumented students uh, has also been a proposal that's been floated to try to strengthen the opportunities for undocumented students, uh, both uh, those that are foreign born as well as those that are native born, um, to get access to higher education. So what does this mean? Um, First of all, I think it means that immigrants are challenging us uh, to live with significantly greater cultural diversity than we are accustomed to. Um, I came to Minnesota from New Hampshire in 1974. Uh, I live in South Minneapolis. Um, since I had moved to South Minneapolis, um, we have had a wide range of individuals move into South Minneapolis, uh, 20,000 to 25,000 Somali residents. I have many more Latino residents on my block than I did when I first moved here. There were none. Um, and so you don't have to be here very long to realize that the landscape is changing and that one is challenged to think a little bit differently than one did um, when basically we were a state that was 95% white. The diversity sometimes makes it difficult to meet human service needs. The facts support this. It is not easy to meet all the human service needs that are represented in these populations. But it does provide significant opportunities to strengthen our current workforce and meet our future workforce needs. It also encourages Minnesotans to become global citizens and part of more diverse communities. Nothing provides a quicker education to diversity and one-on-one -on -one relationships with people who don't come from the same place, don't necessarily originate with the same language, 
don't necessarily think in the same religious terms as you do. When you come face to face with that and engage in dialogue about this, you cannot help but be a better educated citizen for our world. Having an immigrant presence promotes integration into our global economy. Perhaps Bill will tell us more about that in his remarks. So we still have unanswered questions. And I apologize if I've been moving through this at the speed of light. Um, I had 30 minutes, and I had a lot of stuff to tell you to be the Joe Friday today. So, um, But now I'm going to pause just a little bit and slow it down a little bit. I'm just going to say, here's some things that we need to know more about. First of all, we don't know how levels of immigration and immigration patterns have changed since the last census. We have the uh, American Community Survey, which I've mentioned is a sample survey. Um, we have now the completion of the 2010 census. We are hopeful that that will provide us a significantly, significantly more information about these levels of immigration. We don't know how immigration to the state has been affected by our current recession. We don't have very much information since 2008. Um, in 2008 was such a marker year for our state, both in terms of our employment patterns and in terms of our savings and assets in the state, in terms of even the fiscal viability of state government. Um, but without further information, it's hard to know uh, what exactly this recession has done uh, in affecting our immigrant populations in the workforce. To what extent, if any, are Minnesota's immigrant workers competing for jobs with native workers? And what impact may this competition have on wages? I think we have to deal with this question head on. I don't think this is a question to steer around. I think we want to talk frankly about what it means for native born workers in Minnesota um, and why, in the end of the day, we still are going to have significant workforce needs that all can share. To what extent, if any, are Minnesota's immigrants competing with historically oppressed minority groups for resources and employment? And what is the best way to address perceived conflicts between these groups? We know these groups, these issues exist. Uh, we've done needs assessment work at the Wilder Foundation uh, for uh, different United Ways across the state. Uh, and in one of our studies in western Minnesota, I was amazed to find out the level of uh, anxiety and distrust uh, associated with immigrant populations that was shared among historically oppressed. Uh, we know that these difficulties exist. We know some of the background for why these issues exist. Uh, but we don't really have successful ways of engaging in this discussion yet. Uh, I think we should look for models for engaging this discussion. What is the most effective way to ensure that schools and social service providers in communities with high levels of immigration are not overwhelmed by immigrants? I think for this particular question, I think we can do some individual community case studies to really further our understanding of how communities that perhaps are adjusting better than others are doing and how they're doing it. And finally, what, if any, successful strategies have already been established for helping to ease cultural tensions between immigrants and native-born residents? Uh, there are examples of this in many rural regions as well as in the metro area. Um, and uh, I think we need to examine further what kinds of strategies uh, we can engage in that will make a difference in reducing cultural tensions and making it possible to have a reasoned dialogue.